what would the world be like if every single person had the potential and the power to start a quiet revolution? A bit about myself. I'm a musician. I'm a scientist. I'm 16 years old. When I was five, I was looking through some picture books one day in my room when I realized all of a sudden that I had discovered how to read. This prompted my parents' decision to homeschool me, and I didn't set foot in the classroom until I was 12. Being homeschooled, people asked me a lot of questions when they found out that I wasn't in school. Are your parents teachers? Do you just stay in bed all day, eating sweets, watching telly in your pajamas? And occasionally, how did you learn? A little bit before I was meant to start, or I would have been the right age to start in first year, when I was 12, we made the decision that I should go to secondary school. Homeschooling had worked really well for primary school, but it was time for me to go to school. Unfortunately, the school I wanted to go to had no space in first year. Luckily, they did in second year. So 12-year-old Sarah goes to school, experiences a case of mild culture shock for about two weeks, settles in, gets on really great with the teachers like the big nerd she is, makes loads of great new friends and lives happily ever after. That's it, thanks for coming to my talk. So, I was 12. Have you ever looked around at your life one day and realised that the word extracurricular is a bit of an oxymoron because you're actually doing more stuff in your free time than you are in your school time? This happened to me. I play the violin and the piano, and at one stage I was a member of three separate orchestras. In second year, I was given the opportunity to join the Trinity Walton Club, an initiative that was set up for the first time in 2014 and consists of, at the time, 60 students going to Trinity every weekend to learn science, technology, engineering and maths at an incredibly advanced level because we all love the subject. So from my Saturdays of going for my violin lesson, then over to orchestra and then going to Trinity to do some physics, back for quartet and the music theory lessons and then home to do some studying, the two areas of science and the arts became irrevocably interconnected in my mind. Now, as a society, we like to tend to put everything, you know, the, like the left brain activities, we have stuff like science, we have stuff like physics, we have all these, these like, analytical things that have absolutely no creativity in them whatsoever. We put them over here, and we put everything that is creative. We have art, poetry, music, painting, that's all over here. Suddenly, I had a massive area the size of this spot, and it was just everything all connected in my head. I think partially this had to do with me being homeschooled. People talk about being homeschooled as an effort to think outside the box and, you know, oh my God, that's so cool, you're like completely defying society's expectations for you. I wasn't, I just had my own set of expectations and I lived in my own box, which just didn't happen to be the same as everyone else's. So, did you know when you're sitting on an airplane and you're really, really, really happy with your life, you couldn't be more chuffed because you're going on holidays to Spain or somewhere, and next thing, a gust of wind or something hits the airplane and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. that's called turbulence. The best way we have to, gra to visually represent this at the moment isn't a mathematical formula, it isn't a set of physics graphs, it's Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night painting. When photography was invented, we, for the first time, didn't have to paint pictures of people to remember who they were, what their life, their work and their love was. We could now capture a single moment in a picture. People say that a picture tells a, a thousand words. I believe that sometimes one sentence can make a thousand pictures in the mind of a listener. I'm going to ask you now to open your imaginations because we're going to go on a journey. The year is 1948 and you're in Russia. You're standing on a corridor outside your apartment. You're wearing a hat, and you have your suitcase packed and your coat on, and you're ready to leave at a moment's notice. It's in the middle of the night. You know you should be asleep. It's that time of, of the evening, or perhaps the morning, when it's so late that time doesn't have a meaning anymore, because it's just stretching. But you can't sleep, because you know that at any minute, you could be arrested. Your name is Dmitry Shostakovich, and you wrote a piece of music that has the potential to start a revolution. Eleven years previously, in 1937, Shostakovich wrote a piece of music, his fifth symphony, which you're all going to listen to exactly when you get home today, because I told you to. <laughs> this piece of music saved his life. Stalin was getting a little bit annoyed with him 
because he wasn't fulfilling the expectations of what a good Soviet composer at the time could have been. And Shostakovich wrote this piece, and it saved his life and that of his family. The reason Shostakovich was waiting in the corridor 11 years after this, in 1948, was because he had two little children who were asleep in their beds, and he didn't want the arrest of him to be dragged away, possibly never to be seen again, to wake them up. Shortly before his death, Shostakovich wrote his, fifth, or his eighth string quartet. He wrote this piece in memorial of himself because he figured that no one else would do it for him. He told his own story. This is what we do through photos. This is what we do through physics, to poetry, to music. We see the world through our own lens and we aim to display this and to show it to everyone else so that everyone else can know how we feel and what we did with our lives. Dmitry Shostakovich was many things. He was the man who wrote an opera about a giant disembodied tap dancing nose dancing across the stage for two and a half hours. You should YouTube that, it's quite funny. <laughs> he was a father, his father, Shostakovich, is Shostakovich Sr., worked for Dmitry Mendeleev, who you might know as the guy who arranged the periodic table of elements. His daughter and his son both became very well-known concert pianists and his daughter became a biologist, science and maths, and music. But most of all, Shostakovich was a quiet revolutionary. This is what a revolution does. It's not a big idea, it's not a massive, massive, massive thing that happens. It's a small word, an idea, every single one of the individual notes in Shostakovich's symphony. We live in the universe. Plot twist. In this universe, there are galaxies, there's our solar system, there's Earth. Earth is made up of continents, composed of countries, composed of counties, composed of cities, composed of families, composed of people. People are made up of billions upon billions upon billions of atoms. Every single one of you in this room right now, the person you're sitting beside, your seat, this microphone, we're all made up of the same stuff. If you don't believe me, if you think that physics and music and poetry have absolutely nothing to do with each other, when you leave here today, I want you to go outside. Be still for a minute. Breathe. It's good. I want you to look up at the night sky, and I want you to look at the stars. When I look at the stars, I see our past, I see our present, and if you look hard enough, you can see our future. In the sky, you can see the culture of, and the society of every single person who ever lived on this planet that we call home. You can look far back enough in time that you are seeing planets that might not even be around anymore. You're seeing stars that possibly don't exist, but we won't know about it. Stars, when you look at them, you're seeing a gigantic ball of gas, an incomprehensible distance away, that would take 100,000 lifetimes and then some to get to. We're not going to get there. Well, we can hope. When I look at the stars, I see the intersection of poetry, of film, of music, of culture. I see Star Wars, I see Star Trek, I see E.T. I see Dvorak's The Planets and Halt's The Planets. And I see our future. Sometimes, whether you're in Russia in the 1940s, or yes, in Ireland in 2017, you need a bit of hope. When you look up at the stars, you're seeing the inspiration for centuries, for millennia. Because of this, I truly believe that one act, quiet revolution, can change the world. So, I want you all to go. Be absolutely inspired at the boundless human optimism human potential for discovery, for creation, for survival and endurance. And no matter what anybody tells you, never forget that words and ideas can change the world. Thank you very much.